Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. After six weeks of working from home, it is to elaborate how to bounce back post-COVID-19 legal, tax, and financial aspects. My name is Peter Deubert, and I'm the Deputy Director General of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. COVID-19 will rewrite the way we will do business in future, and businesses need to adapt to this new normal. News of how automakers in India have partners have partnered with leading ventilator makers show just how far and quickly companies are able to adapt to an entirely new scenario. Another source of encouragement lies in how some of the international companies in China have managed to go back to businesses in less than two months after the crisis peaked over there. Some companies were actually able to go back to full capacity within two to three weeks. I'm happy to introduce our knowledge partner of today, Rödel & Partner, a German family-run consultancy firm with almost 50 years of relevant experience globally and also 13 years of India experience. Rödel & Partner is a one-stop shop for legal, tax, tax declaration, BPO and audit services. Wordle will be represented by Rahul Oza, who is a lawyer and partner and head of the Pune and Mumbai office. Rahul will be assisted by four team members. As always in our webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. The Q&A will be after the presentation. I now request Rahul to start his presentation and to introduce his team. Thank you. Good afternoon, Peter. Thank you very much for your kind words and um, motivating uh, introduction to this very important and um, interesting topic, which we uh, together had um, 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 yeah, shortlisted. I would quickly um, like to introduce you to my colleagues, uh, Mr. Himan Patel, who is our team lead for financial transactions and valuation. Dharamvir Krishnavat Singh, um, my colleague since 11 years with Riddle and Partner. Um, he is the team lead of our office in Mumbai. Um, and uh, with that function, the deputy head, he is himself an, um, a lawyer. Mr. Itesh Chamudia, a senior associate who comes with uh, more than 13 years of experience of transaction advisory from big four uh, firms and now with Rural and Partners since more than two years, um, who is uh, responsible uh, within our team for entire India for all uh, transaction advisory, tax-related advisory. And last but not least, Roshak Tatkalka, Senior Associate, and um, since uh, eight years with Rural and Partner, he is the team lead for finance and restructuring matters, and um, we hope um, that we, you will enjoy now our uh, uh, webinar. Uh, the Q&A session, um, how lively it is and how uh, interesting it is depends on all of your questions. So with this, I would like to um, request Hemant to start on the possible economic scenarios for the businesses. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dovet, and thank you, Rahul, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's uh, dive li uh, right into our uh, topic. Uh, can we go to the next slide? We can discuss the uh, possible economic scenarios and the outlook ahead. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now this blackest of uh, the black swan event, as I would call it, uh, has subjected uh, the businesses and uh, uh, the common people in general to the most unprecedented situation. Uh, now, I thought it would be a good idea 
to take a look at the economic scenarios uh, that might lie ahead for the businesses. Now, we are all very much aware that the current situation is uh, 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 not only unprecedented, but also evolving at a fast pace. Now, there's a great deal of uncertainty about how things would shape up in the near future, uh, medium term future, and uh, longer term future. So, under these circumstances, it is important that this, for businesses to assess the development situation as and when it unfolds and accordingly uh, take very uh, rapid and appropriate uh, business measures or uh, strategic decisions. Uh, so, to, uh, to be able to uh, to enable the, the businesses to take timely decisions uh, which are well thought of and measured, it is important to evaluate all the possible scenarios that could result out of the present crisis. And this way, uh, the businesses can keep their preliminary prepared business response ready beforehand for, uh, uh, beforehand for taking the decision for as and when the situation evolves. So on, uh, on this page, uh, an attempt has been made uh, to evaluate each possible economic scenarios resulting out of the crisis as a function of the virus, virus containment and public health response measures on uh, primary y-axis. Uh, so these include measures like the lockdown, uh, uh, government announced lockdown, social distancing adherence, development of health infrastructure, uh, development of cure or a vaccine or an immunity, etc. And on the x-axis, we we have taken a GDP revival uh, supported by economic policy response of the government. So now, now the current, the recovery out of the crisis uh, can be and um, can be rightly viewed as a function of these two parameters. So we do not know as of now that which of these scenarios will be will unfold, but it makes sense to at least have a possible overview of the scenarios beforehand. And uh, now, for example, if we have a look at uh, scenario A4 on the top right corner, now this is the most optimistic scenario uh, where it would be a V-shaped economic recovery and the virus is contained within the first quarter itself. However, uh, they, however it is also the least likely scenario uh, based on a survey which was conducted uh, for uh, 2,100 uh, global business executives. So only 6% uh, had a response that an A4 is a likely scenario. So let's focus on the scenarios which are most uh, likely. So moving on to the next slide, please. Now scenario A1 uh, is the, uh, is the uh, ha got the highest survey respondent of about 31%. Now, what is the scenario A, A1? Uh, A1 is a scenario where, uh, the, where the virus, uh, is, uh, virus has a recurrence and therefore there is a muted economic recovery or more likely a U-shaped recovery. Now, here what, what has been done is that the entire uh, global major economies are divided into four categories china united states eurozone and world now the first column that you see is an impact of the is a comparison of uh, q2 2020 gdp versus the pre crisis q4 2019 gdp level so how much is a direct impact on the first quarter uh, first crisis quarter now here you see that eurozone is a high uh, most uh, sharp has a has a most sharpest of the decline uh, in the GDP uh, of about negative 14.6 percent, and it's also the last to recover from the uh, recover to the pre-crisis GDP level that is happening uh, that can be expected to happen at Q3 2023. Now here again, China being the first one to enter into the crisis is recovering the fastest that is happening in the uh, next year's fourth quarter. Now, looking at scenario A3, the, where we have assumed that, that the virus is contained, uh, contained with the, and there is no resurgence again of the uh, pandemic, and the larger economies have ret do return to the pre-crisis level. 
so this is also a likely scenario with the second highest uh, survey respondent of about 16%. So it could be a possibility that the actual uh, scenarios could lie somewhere between these two possible scenarios. Now here, what is expected is that uh, China would be the first to recover in the Q4 2020 itself and the rest of the world follows in the Q1 2021. Now here also looking at the India scenario, what we currently have is the latest IMF forecast uh, that the, which also reduces the previous forecast sharply from 5.85% GDP growth for 21, for FY21 to a positive 1.9%. Now these forecasts are from the second week of April and it's likely or, or popular opinion that the actual GDP might even come down to a negative 1%. Now that is a popular opinion and uh, the forecast will be uh, forecast will be updated as and when the situation develops. Also, another thing that IMS is forecasting is that for the next fiscal year, that is FY 2022, India will see a sharp recovery uh, back to 7.4% GDP growth. Now again, 7.4% is again based on a, uh, it's, you have to keep in mind that it is based on a lower base of a low FY21 GDP. So now, uh, since we are talking about the economic responses, of, uh, sorry, fiscal responses of the government also, uh, let's, let's have a look at the fiscal policies of the government which are doing, uh, which are proving to be of help to the government in combating the uh, entire COVID crisis. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so now that there are cer the certain policies and focus areas of the government, uh, which uh, have proved useful uh, in combating and overcoming the crisis and which should be continued further uh, are, uh, uh, so those we can discuss here. So now the digital India, uh, that was the focus point of the government so over the past few years, have actually helped a lot of companies and the even common people in general because of the easy avail availability of internet access, making work from home uh, far more convenient possi and possible. Another thing that was a, that is a corollary of Digital India is the, uh, the digital payment, the UPI, the Beam app, which has made the uh, contactless payment possible. And that is also a, one of the uh, positive points that India has, which is over and above what developed countries also have. Now, uh, the Swatch Bharat is another such campaign uh, which, uh, which has proved useful. And uh, the welfare schemes by the government. Now, these are also important because, uh, uh, because of the uh, digital India and the financial inclusion, uh, the government could very fast roll out its first welfare package as well uh, through direct benefit transfer. Now, the, so the previous policies have uh, uh, proved to be helpful here in rolling out the new welfare schemes as well. Now, from the business point of view, the Make in India campaign uh, could be a very big advantage for India because uh, as uh, every, everyone of you must have heard that the global companies and their supply chain, uh, which are highly dependent upon China, are looking at shifting the production base or supply chain uh, to other countries. So here the promotion of the Make in India and the benefits which are rolled out under this scheme could be an added advantage for India uh, to recover from the current crisis if, if they are able to lower in the global company to shift their production base to India. Now the income tax reforms are again in line and uh, with again in line making the India uh, tax comparable with the global company, with the global economy. Now there are certain areas where Government make can use the current opportunity to uh, to uh, bring in the reforms that they have wanted, and because there is already a disruption in place, they can take advantage of the disruption and uh, pass on the reforms that they had in their agenda to be passed on it later. So this includes labor reforms and uh, land reforms, which are in the works since uh, quite some time. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. 
so now what are the fiscal policy expectations from the government uh, so now these are the industry expectations and not the so these are not what might actually come up so let's call it a wish list in a way rather than um, uh, the fiscal measures that government will announce so one is a very uh, big fiscal stimulus package which to the extent of about 3% of the gdp or 6 lakh crores now um, again this is let's keep it as a wish list because it may not happen that the uh, government may have the uh, have that much of money in their hand to actually come out with this kind of a package now another wish list is that uh, government has been very disciplined in their uh very disciplined in their uh, fiscal deficit targets over the period now it is a demand from the industry that government can increase their debt to gdp ratio uh one of the major one of the ways they can do it by simply monetizing their fiscal debt uh, another thing is that uh, credit availability making it easier uh, for the financial sector uh, to lend to the businesses which actually need them and they could they also is a demand for a tailor made fiscal packages now innovative ways to do this could be that uh, since airlines industries have been hardly hit uh, hit badly so as and when they come out of the crisis they their fuels could be made cheaper by reducing duties and uh, uh, similarly for other industries as well uh, so uh, after this um, i moving on to the next slide please. uh we can move to the next slide please uh so uh, legal preparedness for the bounce back so i give it to uh, dharam who will uh, take you guys through the uh, legal implications for the uh, through of the crisis dharam sure thank thanks aiman good morning to all attendees from germany and good afternoon to all attendees in india my name is dharam krishna uh now that we are moving towards phase exit from uh, lockdown uh, conserving cash for, for next 6 months would be the biggest uh, challenge for all the companies uh, another challenge is we see is of course the business continuity and how to sustain the fixed cost uh, can you go to next slide please yes so uh, in legal preparedness section i will discuss two major legal areas which affect companies across all service lines first is uh, contract and commercial obligations and second is labor laws and hr matters next slide please so uh, we strongly advise the companies to review all contracts in force uh, immediately for example supply contracts shall be uh, analyzed to check whether the companies can meet the contractual obligations which uh, uh, within the you know uh, which can be uh, now uh, uh, completed within the agreed timelines or not uh, manpower supply contract for example which is for contract labors so those has to be reviewed to ascertain whether the contractor is in position to meet his commitments and whether now did the changing scenario whether the company actually require the contract laborers uh, any more or, or in that number again third party vendor contract shall be reviewed to check whether the vendors are in position to meet uh, their obligation very important uh, uh, point of vendor uh, uh, you know uh, contract is that we had seen that few companies are ready to uh, bounce back but their vendors are not so there is something which you know we really have to strategize and plan uh, as soon as uh, uh, we start our operations oh. also we we should see this as a great opportunity for the companies to conduct a, we would say internal due diligence this is a, a, you know something very new concept for the companies to conduct the internal uh, due diligence but it is very important at this point so that all old contracts can be checked and analyzed whether they required any amendments or renegotiations because they need to be really up to date uh, so that if there is any consequences in future then uh, we know what we are getting it. now one point i would like to clarify here is that that exit from lockdown does not necessarily mean end of covid 19 therefore the force majeure clause which is talk of town these days will still be relevant now 
now uh, in uh, every contract the force majeure clause is drafted uh, you know differently therefore every contract shall be analyzed uh, uh, independently some contracts provide that it can be put on hold until the event is resolved and some contracts provide that uh, uh, provide for limitation of time after uh, which either party may cancel the agreement with written notice now uh, we we have received this kind of queries from industry also regarding payment obligations and you know force majeure uh, situation so basically payment obligations are not super uh, suspended as a result of force majeure event therefore party invoking force majeure clause uh, uh, for, for, uh, you know for not paying the invoices for procuring goods or availing services need to be very cautious uh, here now for those contracts which doesn't expressly provide for force majeure clause the indian contract have a uh, act was separately under section 56 now that is about the existing contracts but now what shall we keep in mind while entering into the future contracts uh, so uh, there uh, now the approach has to be completely uh, different for important contracts we recommend the companies to check how did other party actually sail through the corona crisis uh, virus crisis Uh, solvency of other party shall be now uh, checked in uh, interestingly last uh, i would say at least one uh, to two months we had seen a practice in market where the now the companies are ad- asking for 100% advance but there also situation where after taking the advance the other party is not able to perform its obligation under the contract so uh, uh, we have to be really mindful of you know while drafting uh, this situation while drafting such contracts after introduction of insolvency in bankruptcy court of course uh, a lot of recovery issues were uh, resolved quickly but there also we i don't have a, such a good news for you because uh, the threshold for default under insolvency in bankruptcy court has now been raised to uh, from inr 1 lakh to 1 crore so therefore any Uh, dispute, commercial dispute, which is below one crore, the recourse now is back to our civil uh, courts, and we all know uh, how much time and efforts are required uh, there. So definitely, the future contracts uh, has to be drafted, keeping uh, all these relevant uh, points in uh, mind. Can we go to next slide, please? Yes. So uh, in slide. 12 and 13 i will be discussing the developments uh, which took place around labor laws and hr perspective during this uh, lockdown uh, period so as we all are aware that government decided to extend the lockdown and in parallel the number of corona virus infections uh, infections in india also crossed 40000 the notifications came uh, with a long list of what is allowed what is not Uh, there are also relaxations and restrictions uh, on the basis of zones which are green uh, orange and red private offices can operate with 33% capacity remaining uh, uh, team shall continue working from home now uh, just one uh, remark i would like to make is that there is one uh, notification which came from central government and then there are few uh, changes which state governments have made so uh, I, i would request attendees to also check their uh, Uh, notification issued by the state government in this regard like i had seen 33% capacity uh, is there in the central uh, notification but few state also put a cap on number of employees also actually uh, industrial establishment in urban area with access controls are permitted similarly all industrial in uh, all industries in rural areas are also permitted to operate however now companies have to follow the standard operating protocol which are issued by the government under these protocols Uh, i have highlighted few uh, uh, important protocols uh, in my uh, this uh, slide which is in front of you it is obligation of the company to arrange mask for its, uh, mask for its uh, workforce and also ensure that the social distancing protocols are followed all the time uh, one uh, important point i would like to mention here is that that uh, once company is in operation and even after uh, the management is following all the protocols and still if there is a uh, corona virus infection case in the uh, unit what will be the what will happen so uh, we are uh, we can say that actually 
they won't punish the management of the company but there are chances that the unit might be locked down for a period of 14 days or so so that's why maintaining social distancing and uh, providing masks would be very important from this perspective also the second time is of course uh, shift uh, shift timings has to be scheduled in such a manner that the employees are able to reach their home by 7 pm right now we have a restrictions on a moment after 7 pm it is also mandatory now to provide medical insurance for all the workers now we are of the opinion that the companies who are already uh, covered under esi uh, act are not required to have a separate medical insurance for their workers uh, just under esi act uh, uh, the benefits can be uh, is like only the empanel hospitals uh, uh, are there and then uh, employees earning 25000 gross monthly salary less are covered However, few companies also have group medical uh, coverage. So in that case also, you know, they don't have to go for any additional uh, insurance. Here. Now, one important uh, protocol uh, you will notice here is thermal screening, which is basically checking the temperature of the employees and visitors during the, uh, when they enter or exit the premises. Now, uh, by this uh, kind of screening and also health uh, related uh, uh, database which will be maintained the company will re, will generate and collect uh, the personal you know uh, and sensitive information of the individuals and that has to be really maintained and managed as per the ambits of personal data protection laws of uh, india uh, otherwise the uh, it comes uh, the liabilities of the uh, management of the company right now in india we have information technology act and there are rules prescribed under that about how to deal with personal and sensitive data uh, our uh, own indian personal data protection bill is pending uh, before the parliament which can be passed uh, anytime soon which is in similar line with the european uh, union's data protection regulation which will be more comprehensive uh, data protection law so uh, Basically, these points which are there in pro protocol are something which are, of course, new and the corona situation itself is a new and extraordinary situation for all of us. Uh, and they might not be uh, covered under the existing HR policies of the company. So we recommend all the companies to prepare a separate policy for this uh, pandemic and also educate their employees about the same. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, during the uh, lockdown, the central as well as state governments uh, issued orders related to payment of wages and to consider all employees to be on duty during the lockdown uh, period. Now, sadly, such orders and advisories did not factor the financial situation of the companies. And therefore, it, it was expected that few companies might not be genuinely able to comply with these orders and advisories due to their uh, cash flow situation in today only go air was in news for uh, this reason so as of now there is no clarity from the government side how they will deal with the companies who were not able to fully comply uh, with uh, salary payment obligation one other practice which we had seen uh, in market is that that employees are being told uh, to take paid leave so basically uh, it's it's not something which employee uh, would like to apply for and of course also in uh, corona lockdown uh, corona virus lockdown the government notification says said that the employee should be considered on duty however uh, the companies are taking uh, and stand and requesting employees to avail their paid leaves so i'd like to highlight there that actually none of the labor laws give uh, right to employer to compel employees to take paid leave however if the HR manager and the uh, employee consents, then they can create necessary documentation for this, and then uh, they can consider, uh, you know, the uh, paid leaves uh, during this time. Now, HR managers uh, should already start working on a strategy and planning on HR matters, which will crop up uh, post lockdown. It might be required to renegotiate the salaries, the bonus, I said leaves with senior employees and in in parallel wherever there are trade unions so whichever companies have the trade unions so they might be required to renegotiate the trade union uh, agreements so uh, and there might also be some tough decisions like uh, 
termination or retrenchments uh, so the same has to be handled very uh, cautiously so hr manager have a big role to play uh, in next i would say if not weeks then days to come to you know strategize and plan out uh, uh, this uh, important points uh, interestingly uh, uh, the concerns of industry of course uh, are more or less similar so a uh, public interest litigation is being filed before the supreme court on april 14 by nagrika export limited which highlighted the hardships faced by the companies in complying with the government uh, orders so uh, the supreme court issued notice to the central government and the central government have to file the reply on may 11 therefore by uh, next week uh, we will get to know about stand of uh, government on the issue related to wage payment during the lockdown the leave reduction etc however uh, during uh, this time only like uh, last week bombay high court in a case of align components uh, uh, made a very interesting uh, clarification it said that if a worker fails to join the duty wherever the lockdown is lifted the employer would have a liberty to deduct their wages for their absence subject to applicable law now as we all know due to hardships faced by migrant laborers during this uh, pandemic they might take some time to gather trust and confidence to return back to operations therefore once the operations start the companies can firstly stop making payments to those workers who are not uh, uh, or who fail to join the duty and uh, of course take other action which are available uh, uh, our labor laws so to conclude uh, i would uh, suggest the companies uh, that uh, uh, it's very important to analyze the existing contracts and uh, policy which will in a longer run help them in conserving uh, uh, their cash and to adapt uh, with the new normal and uh, it is must right in uh, right uh, in current situation to avoid any unnecessary litigation cost or you know representation required before any of the department be it labor department at least for next uh, few months so this kind of strategic uh, planning will really help in long run so uh, thank you uh, very much and now my colleague mr itesh and mr rushak will take over and guide us through restructuring and corporate optimization thanks tara and good afternoon to all the attendees attending this webinar so as we experience uh, these that the global uh, business environment is currently witnessing an unprecedented challenge most of the countries steadily going into lockdown the businesses across the globe have taken or started taking a hit india hasn't been an exception so looking back at the past global recessions which have taken place in 2009 or early 80 uh, studies reveal that 40% of the companies even couldn't return to their pre recession sales and profits post the global recession how it resulted in 17% of the companies didn't even survive after the recession in contrast at least 9 approximately 9% flourished after the slowdown doing better on certain key financial parameters and so uh, it it uh, comes up like the firms that take faster uh, cost faster cost cut faster and deeper and who invest more than rival competitors does not necessarily flourish or uh, fare well in the uh, global recessions post global recessions accordingly companies that master the delhi uh, the balance between both the scenarios of recession and slowdown between the two aspects of cutting down the cost plus or restructuring of their financials would have served the uh, would have sailed through better and this leads to our uh, presentation where this uh, topic on restructuring corporate optimization so currently the first slide which are talking about is a life cycle of a covid impacted businesses so uh, how the survival of a business post covid uh, uh, would take place so we have classified into three phases which a company business can be uh, churn out into it's a first a turn around then a restructuring phase and a resolution phase talking about the turn around phase the current restrictions are resulting in unprecedented disruption in supply chain cash flow issues and funding gaps for the businesses to which the management has to manage their liquidity so they have to plan for alternative modes of financing identify and evaluate different options of funding either intra group or get it from a holding company and to sum up how do we do it in a 
tax regulatory and a legal possible manner efficient manner secondly cost rationalization how do you create some shared cost services organization for all the it services or any kind of services how do we improve the procurement of goods and services and sourcing capabilities between the organization third one would be revisiting your capex requirement need to understand what is the immediate requirement of the capex continue maintaining and operating assets efficiently is there any current need to have a capex expenditure or it can be delayed in future thirdly can you uh, lastly and it can be your right sizing of your head account will be your employee count how do you allocate your employees to different division different businesses and how do you reshuffle the or employees so that they are uh, optimally utilized and lastly would be the stabilization of revenue and margins how do you stabilize your uh, uh, revenues and margin post the covid impacted and how do you return to your normality in a, in a stabilized manner which is needs to be looked into that is what we are talking about in a turnaround phase looking to the current scenario focus of business owners and management are likely to be more managing the core business and its recovery which leads us to the second phase of turnaround if we cannot turn it around in a manner which is mentioned we can we we'll move to the next phase which is a restructuring phase restructuring uh, sorry uh, the previous slide only yeah so restructuring phase where we have the management at least segregate their non core business activities separately from their core uh, existing business activities so they can focus on their main business and try to recover those business and keep aside the non core assets where they can identify suitable buyer and uh, have a uh, liquidity at that time. that is what is meant by a sale of non core assets raise equity or debt finance which i have already said either you raise a debt equity but in the current scenario getting a debt from an uh, lender which seems difficult you have to fund it within the group or get a cheaper debt of an overseas market and then route it through your overseas companies uh, could be looked into third we would do refinancing uh, looking out for a cheaper loan and uh, repaying existing loan but that would have its own nuances with from a tax with it with regard to interest deductibility and uh, from a regulatory fund point as well uh lastly on the financial restructuring which could be in two forms can be in the form of equity restructuring or it can be the debt restructuring equity restructuring may be to correct your over capitalization uh you can uh is revalue your assets or maintain a proper debt equity mixture you know respect or you can over uh, wipe off your existing losses against your capital that can be looked upon as an equity restructuring coming to the second part of a debt restructuring where you want to reduce your cost of capital increasing the liquidity where you may look upon options where you can get uh where you can negotiate your contracts with your lenders try to reduce the uh, rate of interest or the period uh of your loan uh, or any terms of contracts which you can negotiate which will give you a relief from pay, uh, the immediate payment or you can arrange for some kind of arrangement with your creditors through a scheme of arrangement under the company act where you can uh, uh, arrange for uh, some kind of equity stake in the company for a proportionate uh, debt involved in it. and the lastly which you can do for a consolidation or delinking of business where you can generate or unlock value for a shareholders by segregating your businesses into different silos or consolidating entities into one by way you can repatriate your funds to the uh, the shareholders in an efficient manner considering this phase if nothing fulfills from uh, the restructuring phase as well then the last option which leads to an uh, organization or an impacted business is to go through a resolution phase which is an rbi framework which also provides a resolution phase where companies which are governed by rbi you know, necessarily goes through this phase and the lastly most renowned phase in current times is the insolvency the ibc phase where companies which are not able to fund their de uh, debt are generally taken to ibcs uh, and uh, there might uh, be certain restructuring which needs to be done at that point but looking at the current scenario in government uh, regul uh, challenges and the courts involved this may take a longer period of time hence to avoid ibc it's better you focus on restructuring or a turnaround phase in order to avoid the resolution phase next slide please now we mo mostly will focus today uh, on the restructuring phase uh, first of all so restructuring phase what we talk about is 
that due to this uh, entire COVID uh, impact, whether there is any opportunity for a business restructuring whereby I can restructure my business in a certain manner which, which will be less impactful post my COVID and I can uh, generate to value or, uh, or revenue for my firm. So firstly, to uh, start with, will be the ring fencing and ring fencing of businesses from risk and protecting the enterprises. Before going into ring, I'll just give you an example of how what we mean by ring fencing of businesses. So take an example of, of a company having two businesses, or businesses which uh, one which is highly profitable and everything, and the other one which is highly risk profile with huge debt in it and uh, with, uh, which is linked to guarantees given by the promoters and with their personal assets. So how do I de-link those risks from my existing businesses which are profitable and which should not be impacted due to this high risk business? So in a prop, uh, we'll have to identify or uh, conceptualize the idea of de-linking these businesses into a separate entity so that my existing business doesn't get impacted due to these high risk businesses. Second example could be uh, an entity having two uh, two companies uh, ideally, uh, so a common shareholder having two entities. One of the companies, uh, sorry, yeah. So I was saying uh, where you have a common shareholder having two businesses and one of the businesses is highly debt leveraged. How do you do the interfunding of uh, those companies? How do you protect the value of both the entities together? How do you consolidate? So that is what we are talking about, the protecting the enterprise value and the ring fencing. So it becomes very essential to de-link or to segregate your businesses, which is not core and which are not strategic. You can segregate and you can have liquidity for those businesses which will be enabled for the existing business to help to form a liquidity for the existing business and which enables at least for fundraising and capital raising for the existing businesses safeguarding their existing value as a whole. Currently your existing businesses may have certain possible JV or uh, MA transactions which you may foresee for which it's possible that you divest your existing business in a separate entity because all MA restructuring prior to doing any kind of deals and everything takes a lot of time. So even if you want to do a deal, there are certain uh, investors which might be interested in your businesses and not the entity as a whole. You may need to carve out the businesses through so a slum sale or a deal merger or a asset deal. Doing a deal merger uh, may take a longer period of time since it involves regulatory authorities approval, but that comes with a benefit of being a tax neutral in the hands of shareholders as well as a company. Doing a slum sale may have a tax implication, but Considering the time involved, it may be less. If we are envisaging any MA activities in future, it is possible that we plan it today in a proper manner and have it uh, uh, correctly say, uh, segregated. Thirdly, we come to the simplifying the cost, uh, the group structure and cost reduction. So, what exactly we are talking about for entities operating in small scales to sustain in this phase is indeed a challenge. From a survival perspective, consolidation strategy can be looked upon. It may reduce your overall group expenses, your working capital blockages between the two entities, your GST transaction or a TDS impact within the two entities or transactions which may take place. It may also reduce your cost. It may also reduce the effective tax rate as a whole as a business, where you may think of consolidating both the enterprises and utilizing the amounts of depreciation and tax of both the enterprises, as well as you may think of certain repatriation uh, of the funds, existing funds which are available in your entities. And seeing the current valuation as well, it's possible that you can restructure at a very lower cost, transaction cost at this possible time. And consolidation, uh, I may say, you know, to give you a few instances of consolidation might be companies involved in similar line of businesses or complementary businesses, supplementary businesses may be consolidated, or a company having a holding structure uh, whether a holding company holding investments in Indian companies, whether the holding company is just a mere holding, which may expose them to certain regulatory challenges or risks like an NBSC or CSC, you may think of consolidating both the entities. There may be a larger group where you have recent acquisitions, where you have a couple of Indian entities spread across the groups where you may think which are doing the similar businesses and you may uh, incurring additional cost or incurring uh, similar kind of duplication of cost, legal compliance costs, you may think of consolidating both the entities or you may have manufacturing, trading, and service companies which interlinking the services. There is a possible opportunity of thinking of a consolidation. 
Thirdly, we move to the reviewing of a holding company structure where you will think about a company or an LLP structure. Though com LLP structure comes out favorable in this time due to the repatriation of profits being without tax and everything, but uh, the company structure right now, the government has also liberalized the tax rates for the company from uh, to around 22. 25% uh, considering the surcharge and sales approximately and uh, the new companies which are involved in manufacturing the company is incentivized by giving them a 15% tax rate excluding the surcharge and sales. So it becomes quite evident the company structure though has certain uh, tax uh, doesn't have doesn't have the tax advantages of a repatriation of cash flow but it had, it had certain flexibility in a restructuring issuing a convertible uh, instrument or a ccd but that flexibility are not generally embedded in an llp it, it definitely uh, results in a roadblock in, uh, in cases of restructuring or a flexibility of uh, issuing a convertible instrument Lastly, we come to uh, another option of restructuring where we have balance sheet resizing, where a balance sheet of Indian company is very bloated and there are a lot of impacts of current uh, impacting the future profits as well. So if the company is in future profit, but current year losses are so much that it's balance sheet bloated and it has exhausted the net worth, you may think of certain balance sheet resizing or you may think of there are certain unrepresented assets or assets which have lost the value which you think of reducing against your capital which may create a distributable reserves for you in the future it may create a positive impact at the overall group level where you have a positive network it will also impact your financial ratios it will improve your financial ratios basically the eps the earning per share would improve and the return on capital there shall be no impact on your carry forward of tax losses or depreciation. Minimal transaction costs may be involved in such a transaction. So there are a few companies who have already done such a rate of thing with quite a bit listed companies like Future Consumer Limited, Data Soft Application Software Limited, Trigon Technology. They've all gone through this right sizing of balance sheet where they have utilized their losses against their capital. Uh, that sums up with this. So even though business structures also were business structures, even Pico. COVID-19 may not be aligned in current requirements. COVID-19 has exposed those businesses to new challenges. So even these business structures evolved before COVID-19, but now it has become a really a necessity to do this or think over it, whether this needs a necessity in the current scenario. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So lastly, we are talking about the last phase of our resolution where you cannot do any restructuring exercise or the restructuring exercise cannot be uh, fruitified, fruitified. Then we have the recent uh, uh, IBC where you have must have heard that there are IBC matters which are lined up before the NCLT and there are no uh, resolutions which are being formed up because there are no buyers currently looking at the courts and there might be no buyers for you who might be really looking out for uh, buying your entity. So it might result in a lastly in a liquidation of your entity which is the worst case scenario which can happen so looking at the uh, ibc process the, there are, which comes with itself with the current post of tax regulatory and uh, commercial challenges so with tax challenges even if you acquire an entity which is in the ibc phase it may have challenges where you're acquiring at a value which is less than the fair value it may also have an impact on your past tax losses though government has given certain release in case of an IBC transaction. The lenders may also have an impact on the Indian company's balance sheet because that might uh, lead to waiver of your liabilities which may be considered as an income for the Indian companies and even if you have an ECB and you may tend to take a haircut it may require an RBI approval and all compliances hurdles may raise. So the mechanism to raise further debt in the light of existing debts might also become a challenge so these are the recent trends where IBC are facing a lot of challenges and which may have a lot of impact post COVID-19 as well. So just to summarize or conclude what uh, the entire uh, this thing, it would be better that every organization may adapt to the challenging business environment and identify a business growth opportunities through restructuring of its existing businesses thereby taking advantage of the future expansion or m a transaction or JVs which they want to enter into, which would be fruitful for their future m and transaction. With this, I hand it over to my colleague, Rusha, who would uh, extend this uh, for the m and part of the transaction in the COVID scene. Rusha, please. Yeah. Thank you, Itesh. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. So here, 
currently in the pandemic situation of COVID-19, which brings a large degree of uncertainty to the whole daily making process. Now the buyers, sellers, everyone are looking for various deal protection mechanism for transactions. So, which are under being negotiated. So in this situation, it's very important for companies who are planning to go for acquisitions to expand the scope of their due diligence to verify various points which will affect their deal value and have serious repercussion on their acquisition plans as well. So coming to that, uh, as Dharam already said, that there should be a business continuity management and crisis management plan for companies. You should also now see that your uh, target, the sellers companies are also uh, having these kind of plans. It's very important to see whether the seller is focused on business and trying to keep his operations uh, up to date uh, to the most extent possible current situation. Uh, additional focus also should be on, on the supply chain of the seller. So we have to see now whether seller is over depended on any particular supplier, uh, whether any of the suppliers are coming from any COVID affected regions like from China or something and, and how that will affect the entire supply chain of the seller. Uh, financial conditions of sellers customers like we are also said as Dharam said earlier that you need to see how your customers are dealing with the situation. Are they able to recover, collect their receivables? The same has to be done even for sellers customers now so as to uh, not be in a situation where you don't have to uh, fight for these uh, collection of receivables and go beyond them. The objective in every way under even due diligence now has to be more on, on finding opportunity where cash can be preserved. So we need to even review the agreements from a perspective where few contracts which can be negotiated. Can we have any uh, contracts which will be defaulted by seller and uh, have uh, additional pressure and check these things on uh, in the due diligence now. Next slide, please. Uh, here we are just saying in case you have already agreed in any MA deal, uh, how you should re it's a time to rethink these deals. So we have taken three uh, cases as such. First of all, uh, if, if you have a joint venture and there's a call option which is due in the joint venture. So under the current situation, uh, the valuations are heavily impacted. And, and if the call option is exercised, it will result in, in a loss of control at a substantial lower valuation. So uh, companies need to check uh, what options are available under such situation. Uh, can you defer the call option? Are there any provisions under the joint venture agreement where you can invoke force majeure? Most of the times, JV agreements don't have force majeure clauses. So uh, for the call option, put option. So we need to check what are the available recourses in such situation. Mm. Uh, maybe your material adverse change clause is, is available, uh, which aims that the uh, party can withdraw on happening of certain transactions. So under such circumstances, we need to review whether materiality adverse change clause is available and and uh, approach the situation and if force majeure or material adverse change clause is not available maybe uh, the cordial relations between parties can be seen and mutually agree to maybe delay or defer this call option under such situations to the second option then we are saying it, today cash is uh, the priority for all the companies so in, in case uh, where you are dealing with a share deal or share transfer deal and the consideration is agreed on, on a full cash payment basis. So maybe you can now think about uh, other options. Can you have deferred cash payment uh, option? Uh, are there other options like can you make a part payment in cash, part in preference shares, redeemable preference shares? Again, uh, these are very uh, options which companies can uh, look into. However, again, we need to be aware of the FEMA uh, restrictions over here. Deferred consideration is only allowed up to 25% and has to be completed within 18 months. So uh, considering these restrictions, we can actually align uh, 
the acquisition and also prioritize our cash application to them leveraged buyouts is the third part so typically leveraged buyout involves where investors looking to buy a company using combination of equity and debt the interesting part of leveraged buyout is in, in typically such transactions the acquired company's assets are uh, used as a security portion uh, in the debt for such buyouts the investor also uses cash generated by such acquired company to pay down the debt the real risk of leverage buyout is the financial pressure pressure of these debts which is uh, on the acquired company therefore uh, companies need to uh, check because of their heavy dependency on uh, cash they need to have precise calculation on future cash flows and and review them in such situations and the last point is is uh, whether timelines are affecting of course uh, in such situation where nclts and all the government authorities are also uh, not working at the full capacity the timelines might be affected post merger integration and control mechanism also in such situation could be uh, restricted due to the travel restrictions and all but uh, that's not uh, one uh, negative part only maybe post merger can be even uh, done quite seamlessly so companies need to consider these points uh, if they are already in pre agreed m and deals yeah with that i'll conclude uh, over to you rahul thank you very much um so now time is running um, against us um so let me quickly go uh, to the uh, slide number 22 please um as a closing remark i think um next slide please um i think what we should be very much aware is that yes the current scenario in india a uh, global scenario is uh, very difficult um but for india it may comprise as well a couple of um yeah positive incentives one thing is if the indian government comes up with an um fabulous stimulation package which is expected by um and what the rumor is about um then then we can boost uh, the indian economy to a next level where we can uh, support our uh, global uh, supply chain where we say uh, as representatives of german companies where a portion of the um, supply chain um, which is as of now with um, with china uh, can shift it as well to india there are about thousand uh, companies uh, discussing with the uh, state and central government um, on various options of uh, uh shifting their transact uh, their businesses to to india from china or various other countries i think um this is something where we have to gear up now our indian entities um of uh, multinational companies to 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 be prepared to be aware um to have the balance sheet on the right size um to to be available for growth perspectives and present as well the growth the growth perspectives from the business per, uh, perspective um that's um in this slide you can see all um that we have gathered some um interesting um, um news so let's see how this time india will um will convert this news headlines into reality thank you very much i think we should now due to the time restriction shift to the short q a session thank you very much rahul this is mona's desai time share we've received a couple of interesting questions so i'm going to shoot it out right away and i request ladies and gentlemen to please hang in there as they could be of interest to you as well rahul i'll start with you first question uh, if you could answer in brief, what are the major do's and don'ts for a solid bounce back post COVID? Something in bullet points, if you could address. Um, 
I think the biggest do is uh, be careful uh, in in all lines. No, don't don't act too harsh. Uh, act um, wisely because now even if if you um, um, spin off certain businesses or lay off employees. We know that in India, uh, under the, um, it is a huge issue to get skilled workers. So regenerate the the uh, forces and everything can be can be very tough, and then on, on the long term uh, have a negative impact. You should really the, the the biggest thing is you should really see your scenario, your business, your legal uh, and tax structure, um, your financial structure, and come up with an long lasting and not short short term will uh, um, visible uh, approach thank you rahul our next question uh, is for hemant hemant what is the likelihood for the big infrastructural reforms with some reference to land and labor reforms uh, thank you, Manas. Uh, so, uh, so the likelihood is uh, currently uh, unknown. Uh, it is just an opportunity for the government that there is already a disturbance in the system, economic system. Uh, so, rather than creating a new disruption, whenever they come up with a uh, reform, this could be an opportunity that can be used by the government to uh, take advantage of the disruption and come up with the reforms as at, as early as possible. But in the presently, uh, within the next quarter, nothing, no such possibility. Much, uh, Dharam, the next set of questions are for you. So uh, I will try to club at least two together. Whether payment of basic salary, excluding allowances like HR, A, conveyance, other allowances are considered as payment of salary. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, so uh, thanks Munas. Actually, the point uh, came up for discussion uh, in the Bombay High Court Matters Aligned Components within the court held that it expects the petitioner to pay the gross monthly wages except conveyance allow and food allowance. So to that extent, yes, there is. Uh, we see that there is uh, no exception. Otherwise, as of now, all other components has to be paid. Thank you. Now, this is something post lockdown. After opening the office, if an employee reports with positive sy symptoms and is sent to quarantine, will he be considered to be on leave or to be paid without any leave? Okay. See, very interesting uh, question, Munas. And uh, as I said, that as of now, the government notification are not very detailed in this regard. However, few uh, companies that already came up with a leave category called special leave, which actually they would offer to the employees who need to send for self isolation because uh, of the coronavirus issue. Now, actually, the company also have to think from their perspective that uh, if a person have infection and he continue to stay in the organization because of the reason that he feels that you know his leaves might be deducted, his uh, other leave uh, entitlement. It is exposure for the entire organization. So that's why we would recommend uh, the companies to introduce this special leave category till the coronavirus exposure is there. All right, fair enough. Thank you. And one last question on wages. How can we pay APR wages since there is no production and sales during the month? Are there any guidelines issued? And which is the best way for doing this? Munaz, again, very interesting question, and actually I found it very reasonable also because there were no operations in entire month of April. So, government passing on the responsibility on the companies to pay the salary for the entire month when there is no operation is really uh, doesn't make sense. However, the notifications or orders are silent. As I said, the matter is pending before Supreme Court. Let's see what comes out uh, next week. A very interesting uh, thing I would like to highlight is that, that under Indian Industrial Dispute Act, there is a provision for layoff, which says that a company can lay off its uh, workers for 45 days by paying 50% salary. However, the notifications and order issued by government are under Disaster Management Act, which supersede all the laws. So even if the company would have tried to take benefit of that law, uh, I, I think they had a challenge. So I, 
the best we can do is let's wait till next week what's the stand of central government uh, in this regard but this is a very common concern in the industry yes very true thank you dharam uh, next question is for itesh itesh what are the possibilities for companies with a negative net worth oh so very interesting question and most of the companies are facing this issue of a negative net worth so there is no standard uh, solution or a standard idea which can be implemented across the companies but uh, to name a few which you may think over or we may uh, deliberate or we can discuss or we can think over it might be uh, some kind of a debt restructuring arrangement with your existing lenders maybe a conversion of a debt into some equity or kind of your rationalizing your balance sheet right sizing it there might be a couple of options but that needs to be studied based on the financial position of the company Thank you, Itesh. And uh, this is, would be the last question uh, for today afternoon. And Rahul, this is for you. The recovery of China will be on what assumptions? What if all the major companies leave China and set their offices in other countries? What will be the GDP then in that case? Well, um, very speculative uh, question and uh, even more speculative uh, answer. Um, see, from my India, it is very unrealistic that all co companies will leave China, because the uh, way how the Ch Chinese dependency, uh, global dependency on China has grown, is uh, tremendous. I think um, it is like people saying, okay, we don't like Trump, so we uh, stop um, investing in U.S. It will not happen. Um, I think uh, what what will happen is that there will be now from a very high focus on Chinese investments which are in the last 20 years not going down yeah? uh, we are um, we might have a certain um, uh, shift where where India can seen uh, can be seen as an um, uh, alternative I think um, Asia Asia is uh, still the the um, the future hub and will remain the future hub um, I, but who are the major players in um, um, in Asia I think um, um, Vietnam is getting to their um, capacity limits Malaysia um, can be a stronger party um, Indonesia is I think uh, still um, undiscovered um, to that extent but surely um, for India the, uh, the growth rate could be tremendous thank you Rahul that is truly a positive note this is what I call a yes or no answer perhaps this is for all the panelists and also the final question is it possible to reduce margin to zero by lowering transfer pricing perhaps a yes or no and then I close it is it possible to um, reduce margin to zero yeah. by lowering the transfer price? So, um, Monas, you are interacting all the time with tax and uh, legal consultants, and you know that there is never a yes or no uh, answer. We, we, otherwise, we wouldn't get paid for. Um, I think um, uh, it, it um, zeroing down, no, but uh, reviewing the transfer pricing structure. Um, can be at this point of time very uh, very helpful uh, we have to um, in intercompany uh, agreements we have as well an additional issue that it is not only this uh, the margin is not only this uh, determined by transfer pricing regime it is as well determined by uh, GST so um, uh, taking that into consideration yes I think we can take an a more aggressive stand of uh, lowering certain um, margins if we can substantiate again that in German uh, the German uh, profit margin is as well low um, and, and due to the global pr price uh, crisis but we, we have to obviously understand that this is a very disputable uh, position and we have to be ready for disputable positions um, so um, yeah um, it is a um, food for thoughts. Thank you, Rahul, and truly thank you. Mr. Doibert, I now request you to proceed with the vote of thanks. Okay, thank you, Monas. I thank you all personally for registering and attending today's webinar.
A big thank you also to our today's knowledge partner, Rödel and Rahul and his team. They were able to demonstrate some of the things businesses need to focus on more in future. From my side, I would like to add that we also need to develop a more caring and flexible working culture, including working from home. In this connection, I sincerely thank the team at IGCC, in particular Sana and Monas, for helping organize yet another webinar. As always, a recorded version of our webinar will be available on our website and we will also and will also be sent to whoever has registered. Please regularly check our website for upcoming events. The second module of our intercultural training webinar is next Thursday at 2.30 p.m. You will learn about Indo-German cultural values and influences that that have on business and social contexts. Dear members and partners, there is no easy way out. The next few months are going to be challenging. Please remember, we are by your side and happy to assist in whatever we can. Speak to us, stay healthy, and take good care of yourselves, your families, and your colleagues. Thank you, and bye-bye. Hi to everyone. Bye-bye.